Hello everyone, back with Patty Reed's doll, chapter 18, Rescue. One evening at sundown, about a week after Milt died, we heard a strange allo ring through the frosty air. Glory be, exclaimed Mrs. Breen and hurried out through the door of the cabin. Before the rest could follow her, we heard her cry out in an excited voice, are you men from California or do you come from heaven? And we knew that help had come at last. There were a party of seven men whom the people of California had sent up to rescue us. They told us how Mr. Reed and after him, the folks who had made their way out before Christmas had told of our plight and begged for help in rescuing us. There had been a war in California, and now it was no longer a foreign country, but one of the United States. And that was part of the reasons why they couldn't get help to us. Patty's father had started out several times, but flooded rivers and heavy snowstorms had forced him back. But he was on his way again, and before long we should see him. The food they brought gave the folks of the starved camp new strength, and immediately many of them wanted to leave for the valley. The men were worn out themselves, and the trip wasn't easy, they said. Three of them pushed on to the Donner's camp, while the others rested in our cabins. Six of the folks from Donner's, including Leanna, came back with the three men. When Patty and Leanna saw each other, they both exclaimed in shocked tones, you are so white and skinny, I could hardly recognize you. Twenty-three were to leave with the first relief party. They told the others that help would reach them shortly, too. All of the Reed family was chosen, and for the first time in over a week, Puss seemed to notice what was going on. Everyone had to walk, the men said. No one would be able to get through if he had to carry a child. Late on the morning of the 22nd of February, we filed through the pine trees and the men with packs on their backs marching ahead to break the trail. The older children kept up with them pretty well, but the Reeds and Leanna Donner lagged far behind, encouraging three-year-old Tommy to keep going. Patty soon became exhausted herself, and when Mr. Glover, the leader of the rescue party, came back and told Mrs. Reed very gently that he was afraid Patty and Tommy would have to be taken back to camp. It was Mrs. Reed, not Patty this time, who refused to be parted from them. I can't let them go back. Those who are left, there are too weak and demented to care for them. Well, I'll have to turn back if they do, she pleaded. I think you should go on, Mrs. Reed, Mr. Glover told her. The other two children will make it, and what little food I have with me, I'll leave with Mrs. Breen to feed Patty and Tommy. But when will they be rescued? Patty's mother begged. I'll turn back myself the minute we get to Bear Valley, Mr. Glover assured her. Mrs. Reed was silent for a long while, weighing in her mind which course she should take. Finally, she asked, Are you a Mason, Mr. Glover? Yes, ma'am, he answered. Do you promise me, she went on, upon the word of a mason, that when you arrive at Bear Valley, you will return and bring my children, bring out my children, if we do not in the mountain, in the meantime, meet their father going for them? Sorry, she's a bit distracting. I promise, Mrs. Reed, he said. Kissing her mother goodbye, Patty said to her, Well, mother, if you never see me again, do the best you can. She seemed not to be crying. I guess she had become so used to disappointment that it was learning to bear it. She was learning to bear it quietly, and taking Tommy by the hand, she turned back with Mr. Glover. The Breens were not very happy to see Patty and Tommy again. Anne would take them in only after Mr. Glover had assured them that there was another relief party on the way. A week dragged by while the children waited. The Breen cabin was very quiet with Puss and the older boys gone. Mrs. Breen said to Patty, I am missing your mother, child, though it's lucky she is to be out of this dirty hole. Soon we'll all be out, please God, said Uncle Patrick, though we're better off than many, for we've not lost any of our young ones. 
The weather was warming up. Almost every afternoon the sun shone, and Patty helped Tommy up the steep bank, the steep snow bank that buried the cabin, and the two of them watched the sunbeams sparkle on the snow. Hurt, hurt, Tommy said, and put his hands over his eyes when the sun was too bright. After the dim gloom of the cabin, the light must have seemed strange to him. One afternoon, the first of March, I have heard them say, Patty sat on the roof of the cabin, her feet dangling in the snowdrift, as her eyes followed the path of a flock of wild ducks in the sky. Birds are very lucky they can fly, Dolly, she was saying to me. Think how fast we should be in California if we had wings. But only angels have wings besides the birds. Milt and Grandma are with the angels now, and lots of other people, big ones little and little ones who came on the journey with us. She must have looked down on earth again, for at that moment she sprang up with a cry, Papa, Papa, and, fe and fell headfirst into the snowbank. Instantly, her father had her in her arms, and she was laughing and crying all at the same time at the sight of him. He told her how he met her mother and Puss and Jimmy, and now they were safe at Sutter's Fort in the valley. Where's Tommy? he asked with a note of fear in his voice. Inside sleeping, she told him, and led him down the hole in the snow into the dark interior of the cabin. Tommy did not recognize his father and stared at him strangely. Papa? Papa? He kept questioning Patty. Five months is a long time for a young one of three to be remembering, said Mrs. Breen. Of course it's Papa, Tommy, Patty told him as he clung to her, fearful that the stranger would separate them. Mr. Reed had baked some sugar cakes before he left the valley, and he gave them to Patty to, distrib to distribute among the other children in the cabin. Give them only one and tell them to eat slowly, he warned. Then he went to the other cabins to give food and help the rest of the sufferers. There were several men with him, and together they went down to the Donner's huts. They brought back three of the older Donner children, leaving Francis, Georgia, and Eliza with their mother and father. The Jacob Donners are too weak to attempt it, Mr. Reed told the Breens, and Mrs. George Donner refuses to leave her husband. He can't last long, poor fellow. The infection in his hand has crept up near his shoulder. It's dreadful. Mrs. Graves and her children and the Breen family left with us. We traveled very slowly. The children were so weak, but everyone was cheerful. At last, the long wait was over, and we were to finish our journey to California. When we camped on the snow that first night out, the men built a fire, and close to it they laid pine boughs for the children to sleep on. Uncle Patrick tuned up his fiddle, and for the first time in many weeks, we listened to songs and happy laughter. By the next nightfall, we had arrived at the foot of the pass, and again we camped as on the night before, and the strains of music floated out over the snowy mountainside. Sleep well tonight, children, Mr. Reed said as he tucked Patty and Tommy in buffalo robes by the fireside. Tomorrow we must scale the pass. There will be no place to camp on the way up. In the morning, the folks noticed ominous clouds gathering over the peaks, and the wind from the south was blowing hard. Three men were sent ahead to get the supply of food that had been cached in a tree on the way up, and the rest labored with all their strength to cross the pass. Hiram Miller, who had been one of our teamsters, carried Tommy, and Patty was bundled across her father's back. We made the grade and by afternoon camped in an open valley among the pine trees. The wind kept blowing harder and the men had to work constantly to keep the fire going. A storm was coming. And by morning, the driving snow was so blinding that all the folks could do was to huddle around the fire and protect themselves from its icy blast. The food was gone and Mr. Reed divided a small package of flour among the 20 people. The children's hunger was not satisfied by the teaspoon of flour, and the little ones cried dismally for more. 
The men worked heroically to keep the fire going and were exhausted by dark, yet they had to sleep in shifts. Patty's father kept first watch, but he must have fallen asleep because the fire died lower and lower, and I could not hear him moving about to replenish it. I tried to cry aloud and wake someone, but what could I do? I was only a wooden doll. Even Patty could not hear my quiet voice. Finally, the cold must have awakened the sleepers. Mr. Miller and Mr. McCutcheon sprang up and started to tend to the fire. Children woke and began to wail, and Patty cried out, Someone help Papa! He's so cold and still! The men dragged him to the fire and chafed his hands and feet, and at last I heard them say, He's reviving. He'll come out of it. By morning, the wind was still blowing furiously, lashing the tall trees about so that the folks feared they might come crashing down on us. By noon, it had quieted, however, and the driving snow let up. Those of us can must go on, Mr. Reed said. Another rescue party must surely be on the way, and if the men we sent ahead are still alive, they'll bring food back. The Breens refused to go. They thought they'd be better off to wait for help, and Mrs. Graves and her children stayed too. The rest of us pushed on through the heavy snow. Mr. Miller again carried Tommy, but Patty refused to allow her father to be burdened with her. I can walk, Papa, she said. You must save your strength to take care of us. Bravely, she struggled through the drifts, but I could tell she was getting weaker. Finally, she stumbled and fell, and as her father came to help her, she cried out happily, Papa, I see the angels watching us. They are out there among the stars. Read, the child is dying, I heard Mr. McCutcheon say, and my wooden heart turned cold with fear. They wrapped her in a blanket and rubbed her hands and feet as they had her father the night before. She was lying very still, and I could no longer feel her heart beat next to me. From the thumb of his mitten, her father drew a little piece of bread. I discovered it in a pocket yesterday and saved it for an emergency, he said. He warmed and moistened it in his own mouth and pressed it between Patty's cold lips. Gradually, her heart beat stronger and she moved. I was dreaming of angels, Papa, she whispered feebly. They were so beautiful. You mustn't see angels yet, darling, he said to her. Remember, Mother is waiting for us down at Sutter's Fort. And Mr. McCutcheon said, you are a brave little child. You inspire all of us to keep going. Now try hard to keep awake and I'll help your father carry you. Warmed by the heat of his body, Patty revived as her father carried her. And eventually we arrived at a place where food had been cached. Over the next ridge is Bear Valley, he said. There will be, then we'll be safe at last. Staggering through the snow, leaving a trail of blood from their swollen, frostbitten feet, the little band was met by Mr. Eddy and another relief party. They had horses with them, and gratefully, though with only a few weak words, the three men and two children rode into the land of sunshine and flowers they had suffered so much to reach. And that is the end of chapter 18. Check back tomorrow when we will read the last chapter, chapter 19, Sutter's Fort. See you then. Bye.